just every, ask everybody on the online to switch their cameras on so that we can just see who we're uh, talking with outside of the room. Hey! Hi, welcome. Oh, that's smashing. Welcome to the University of Leeds. Oh, Pataracci, I can see you're here. Okay, that's smashing. Thank you. So, um, we are going to have two pre-recorded talks as provocations for this session. And then we are going to um, hand over to Julianne, who's going to talk about um, her organisation. And then our brief is to uh, explore the challenges around this topic and then some solutions and try and hone it in a bit because they're huge topics, right? We could talk for days, weeks, hours about the uh, hours, weeks, days about these topics. Um, but this is just a starter for 10. So the idea is that we kind of maybe hone in on a couple of these challenges and potential solutions that will then feed back in main plenary. Is that okay? Great. Okay, I'm going to ask my colleagues at the back then to play the two um, talks that we have online. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Wiley. My assignment today is to be provocative and issue a call to arms that challenges you, the delegates at this meeting and the signatories of the Declaration on the Knowledge Equity Network, to be ambitious in your efforts. I'll attempt to accomplish this assignment by stepping back and sharing a vision of the network in its broader context. If the goal of the network is to help the world overcome unprecedented challenges, including climate change, economic instability, inequality, and poverty, as the Declaration itself implies, the network will have to catalyze an equally unprecedented amount of innovation. As our current approaches to addressing these challenges are proving woefully insufficient, novel, innovative approaches are required if these challenges are to be adequately addressed. It's not the role of the network to create these innovations, of course. The network's role is to catalyze these innovations. The innovation process is typically both expensive and time-consuming. Historically, this has led those who desire to innovate to seek major funding from governments, philanthropy, and venture capital. The limited amount of funding available from these sources, combined with the expense of innovation, has led society to make relatively few investments in potential innovations that could address global challenges. If you're an academic, you may hear this line of reasoning as leading up to a call for an increase in the funding available to academics, researchers, innovators, and other entrepreneurs. But that's not my intention. The Knowledge Equity Network and its focus on open, collaborative approaches points to another possibility. Rather than eternally seeking more funding to support the increasingly expensive enterprise of innovation, what if we reduced the cost of innovation? What if we democratized innovation so that a thousand times greater number of approaches to addressing global challenges were imagined, tested, and evaluated? Dramatically increasing the amount of innovation activity happening globally will be key to unlocking solutions to global challenges. And this is true for at least two reasons. The first is that while we speak of global challenges, these challenges are all lived and experienced locally by individuals. And no matter what training or university degree or work experience you may have, you do not understand local problems like the locals do. When the time comes that we discover reusable design patterns that can successfully address critical problems like climate change and poverty, those patterns will need to be customized before they can work locally. And no one will know a priori exactly what that customization will need to look like. Consequently, the success of these reusable design patterns will depend, in part, on the existence of a broad, diverse network of innovators who can imagine, test, and evaluate local implementations. The second reason we need to dramatically increase the amount of innovation activity happening globally has to do with the power of evolution. Linus Torvalds, the creator of the open source Linux operating system, explained that power this way, quote, don't ever make the mistake of believing that you can design something better than what you get from ruthless, massively parallel trial and error with a feedback cycle. That's giving your intelligence much too much credit." Close quote. If we hope to see the kind of massively parallel experimentation Linus describes, 
we must decrease the cost of innovating. Linux and the rest of the open source software movement provide an instructive example in this regard. The combination of open copyright licenses and collaborative software development practices have resulted in open source operating systems like Linux, open source web servers like Apache, and open source content management systems like WordPress. Today, right now, the majority of the sites on the World Wide Web run on open source technologies, billions and billions of pages of content. The majority of the Internet's technical infrastructure is open source, meaning it's free and flexible to use and experiment with. This freedom from cost and freedom to act has democratized participation and innovation on the Internet on a scale we've never seen before. And this brings us back to education. Higher education, as it is currently structured and organized, is one of the approaches to addressing global challenges that is proving insufficient at catalyzing the necessary degrees of innovation. The creation of the Knowledge Equity Network is an implicit acknowledgement of this truth. Perhaps before we delve further into how the Knowledge Equity Network might catalyze critically important innovation in other sectors, we should begin closer to home and interrogate the network's potential role in enabling radical innovation in the higher education sector itself. As I described a moment ago, unprecedented amounts of innovation online have been enabled by an open, collaborative, and complete infrastructure that makes experimentation extremely inexpensive and fast. If the Knowledge Equity Network were to help catalyze an effort to create an open, collaborative, and complete educational infrastructure, what would that look like? Let me narrow the scope of the question to the realm implied by the text of the Declaration. Let me focus on the intellectual infrastructure of education. What constituent parts comprise the intellectual infrastructure of education? I would argue that this infrastructure consists of at least four parts competencies or learning outcomes, the educational resources that support the achievement of those outcomes, assessments by which learners can demonstrate their achievement of those outcomes, and the credentials that certify those achievements to third parties. An open educational infrastructure to have an effect similar to that of the open internet infrastructure I described before would therefore consist of at least open competencies open educational resources, open assessments, and open credentials. The Declaration specifically mentions open educational resources. And creating and publishing more open educational resources will certainly increase access to knowledge for people around the globe. But OER alone are not a complete educational infrastructure. OER alone will not reduce sufficiently the cost and complexity of experimenting with innovative models of higher education. If the network is to enable the kind of massively parallel experimentation in education that led to the explosive growth of the internet, a complete and open intellectual infrastructure for education must be created, shared, and maintained openly and collaboratively. When open licenses are applied across all portions of this infrastructure, creating truly open credentials, open assessments, open educational resources, and open competencies, resulting in an open educational infrastructure. Each part can be altered, adapted, improved, customized, and otherwise made to fit local contexts without the need to ask for permission or pay licensing fees. Local actors with local expertise are empowered to build on top of the infrastructure to solve local problems freely. Access to knowledge is a good start, but is by no means the end. Access to knowledge is necessary but is not sufficient. I invite you to go beyond providing access to knowledge and instead catalyze dramatic improvements in local educational models around the globe by creating an open educational infrastructure. Only radical, innovative improvements to our educational models will catalyze the discovery of the radical, innovative solutions we must find to unprecedented global problems. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, David. And I know you're on the call as well, which must be slightly strange for you watching yourself to, as a pre-record on the call, but you're very welcome. And can I ask now that we have the second film, please, which is uh, Patarachai. And um, yes, over to the colleagues at the back. Thank you. 
greeting from Thailand. My name is Pat Kiratisin. I'm the Vice President for Research at Mahidol University. It is my great pleasure to join all of you virtually, and I would like to thank the University of Leeds and the organizing committees for inviting me to join this important event. Speaking of knowledge equities, global challenges, and open partnerships, I do believe that everyone agrees that they are very critical for all universities, and they make us all connected. I would like to share my perspective and would love to learn from your discussion. Universities basically have two main missions. First, to create new knowledge, as we call research. And second, to transfer knowledge to our students or learners, as we call academic. Conventionally, both activities occur mostly within the university territories. But now in the real world, knowledge can happen anywhere, anytime, beyond the university's boundaries. So university faculties and all learners should not be locked up in a box. For our missions, the big picture is getting bigger. Research is not only an investigation in a laboratories or in a field or working on the papers, but we have to solve the world problem by advancing technologies, innovation, and social creativities. Without sharing and equitable access, how do we make a progress on new research? We may do similar research over and over and become competitors instead of being collaborators. Academy is not only teaching, but also providing learning experiences and preparing graduates to be ready to the real world. We all know that it is more efficient if our students can explore what they are interested in from any resources, not just in the books that we assign them. Now, we even have a greater expectation. Universities are talking about the third missions, not only academic and research, but also socioeconomic responsibilities. We need to find some breakthrough that causes disruptions that are beneficial to societies or communities, as well as to improve the country's economy, such as supporting startups and SME businesses, or promoting entrepreneurial mindset. We also have to open our doors for more corporate collaborations. We can tackle the realistic issues in the industry. University is not just academic institute anymore, but needs to transform to be an ecosystem to advance the knowledge through research and innovation. Our students are changing swiftly. They are likely to learn from social media where they can gain the social experiences that are not provided in the classroom. The question is, are universities and faculties ready? If not, why? What lifted you? So universities must be more diversified. Universities professors need to transform themselves quickly and continuously in order to prepare our students and the communities to catch up with the world. Therefore, Universities are not only educators, but need to be a coach for the new generations. Sometimes when I talk to our young faculties that you know you are highly expected to save the world, I told them that you need to be prepared to be like a superman or a superwoman. And I am not a joker. How can we be a superman? if we do not have a wide open air space to find to go help people. Likewise, universities need to have open sources for knowledge. Given that a large number of knowledge are created from the universities, so should we be limited to access those? 
In addition, sometimes we need to pay a high price to obtain a piece of information. This could be difficult for middle and lower income countries or most countries in the global south. The more barriers, the less equities. As we can see that there are lower developments in many parts of the world, reflecting a serious issue of inequalities, including in academia. Sometimes when I see my students playing with the IG, which refers to Instagram for them, and that let them connect to the world. I was thinking that it is a similar thing in higher education. I told them that it reminds me to think about IG as industrial and global connection in which every sector, every partners are very important to move the world forward. This is truly the global challenge. We need to have partners who can complement for what we have and to fulfill for what we don't have. Even a computer has a limited space to store. How can we know everything without a collaborative effort among partners? With open partnerships, we can see more open doors to improve ourselves and to guide our students for their desired futures. So why not? In my quick view, I believe that knowledge equities and open partnerships are related and that we should allow knowledge to be easily accessible and allow partners to build up the relationship with less barrier. This is like the open and free airspace that allows everyone, even if we are not a superhero, to find a point where they can see things clearly and look for target at the right direction. Knowledge is a foundation on building the futures. If the futures is a big construction, knowledge are small pieces to incorporate into the structures and strengthen it up. An engineer cannot build the whole building. He would need an architect, an electrician, a promise, and so on. Limited access to knowledge is like a limitation to find quality materials for a better construction. Limited partnerships would not allow us to make a complete building or even make it collapse. Therefore, knowledge equities and open partnerships are important components to make our sustainable futures. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Could we thank both of our speakers who are online? Thank you so much. And I'd like to invite you, Julianne, to uh, respond and also tell us about your work. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Julianne Granley. I work for ICDE, International Council for Open and Distance Education. We are the oldest association for flexible and distance learning. And I'm here both responding and, and uh, summarizing somehow uh, the two videos you just saw and to give a few reflections. So first of all, ICD as a membership organization, we truly believe in the power of networks. Um, really is at the core of what we do and, and what we think is the, one of the most powerful ways that we can impact change together. Now, education needs to change. I think everyone that is here uh, are in agreement. Um, we can probably also agree that education is already changing quite drastically. It has changed quite drastically since uh, 2019 uh, for obvious reasons. There's a couple of changes that we're seeing. Some of them we've talked about today. We've talked about publishing, um, other challenges uh, or changes that is coming up or has been there reverse, uh, related to methodology of the way we teach, the modes we use to teach, 
the technology that's involved in the teaching that we do, but also flexibility uh, has been very important, especially now through the pandemic. If you put this together with the declaration, uh, I would like to, to propose that one of the biggest challenges that really might not be that concrete is um, related to open culture. Um, if we want to ensure knowledge equity and openness, uh, there's a huge challenge in front of us uh, to uh, impact open culture. Now, I wanted to thank the two speakers uh, for your uh, very interesting perspectives. Um, I believe that uh, both speakers really highlighted the need for collaboration um, internationally, um, but also across sectors. I really liked the uh, sentence in the last video about faculty or universities and learners should not be locked up in a box. <laughs> uh, and then with relation to the industrial and global, we need to also consider how we bring academic life and real life together as a part of knowledge equity. Yeah, I think that's uh, probably enough uh, before we start the discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's great, and I also liked uh, in the last talk the, um, that we could be architects, and in the first talk about let's not um, reinvent the wheel. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. What do we think are the biggest challenges in, in um, the global challenges through open partnership um, in higher education and also online? Would anyone like to kick off? I could kick off with a prompt, maybe. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, or at you. least something that I was thinking about during the day is how can the Knowledge Equity Network be a way to be in front of a challenge rather than responding to challenges? Um, Often we see that we are reacting to a problem or something that is wrong with the education system, something that is not working. Um, but there's always the opportunity to proactively push for something to change um, through partnerships. Mm. Claire, sorry Claire, you need a mic because our Zoom colleagues need to be able to hear you and I'm just going to capture open culture whilst you're speaking. Okay. So um, my name's Claire Quinn. I'm a professor in natural resource management at the University of Leeds. Um, and I think from my experience, one of the biggest challenges in, in higher education, particularly around the sort of tackling grand challenges, is how we do interdisciplinarity, how we bring people together. Um, my experience, uh, we were just talking about the fact I did my PhD at York, so in the same, you know, in Yorkshire, um, not too far away from here. Um, and it was funded by UKRI, and it was uh, supposed to be um, ESRC and NERC, so social science and natural sciences joined together to fund a PhD. And the university couldn't figure out how to award me a joint PhD between two departments. So, so I have a PhD in social policy, which has absolutely nothing to do with what I did, which was environment and agriculture uh, in Tanzania, because they couldn't figure out how to make their systems work for interdisciplinarity. That was some years ago now. But I don't think universities have really moved on from that structural uh, boxing in of what we do uh, in universities. Uh, we have our schools and we have our departments and, and we have our structures and our hierarchies. And actually, I think to tackle grand challenges, we need to break out of those old ways of doing things. But the fact that 20 odd years after doing my PhD, we still haven't broken out of those, those boxes, I think, is a big issue and so so again it's not a solution it's kind of how do we how do we do that and how do we do that um, in higher education so that we can tackle those grand challenges um, and I guess attached to that one of the things that we are doing I'm going to kind of 
beat my own drum is working with the University of Pretoria, um, and we have uh, a project, FSNet Africa, which um, Stephen is involved in and, and others um, at Leeds, where we're trying to break out of some of those usual structures and fellows and mentors and food systems and systems thinking and but it is still really difficult when we all work in universities and departments and we have promotion criteria and we have all of those things that that kind of keep us boxed in sorry I'll stop no, thank you claire I, i'm conscious of the fact that i didn't introduce myself or abby who both work at the university of leeds Horizons Institute, which is an interdisciplinary institute, um, so it's on a, a on a pathway to that. But can I add into that interdisciplinarity and intersectoral, mindful of the innovation conversations that we've been having, um, so across sectors? Thank you. D did you want to say something? No, oh no, sorry, I sorry, sorry. <laughs> wow. No. Yes. Please. Please. Hi, uh, I'm Antonio Martinez Arboleda, uh, academic lead for Open Education, um, practice here at Leeds. Um, and I was very interesting, interested to hear um, what David Whaley talked about intellectual infrastructure of um, education. And he talks about competencies, assessment, credentials, resources. And obviously, um, that presents us with a challenge that is complexity. Uh, if these elements of the architecture are open, um, any institution, any organization can produce them, anybody can adopt them. In what way, mm, this is a question for everybody, in what way um, an open partnership, a network can help to manage that complexity? Because um, uh, if we don't try to address the question of complexity, um, this may be rather chaotic and is the partnership open partnership is the network the solution for that yeah thank you thank you um i was going to come to ac and then gideon i th i think i've remembered your name and i couldn't see it from that far away thank you thanks master uh professor Nanshu Chatterjee, uh, professor for digital health and education and dean for digital transformation i think just going to expand on what you said i had the same challenge in sheffield as well and i was doing across three schools so <laughs> impossible to do that but and i don't think we have changed that and there are institutional barriers but i wanted to pick up on something that was noted uh, by david earlier in terms of uh through a democratic process opening up opportunities to tap into the wide potential of the wider crowd in terms of expanding the horizon of innovation beyond the academic walls effectively because there are really great ideas out there how can we make it easier for others to contribute to those challenges because as organizations you'll always have priorities that are sort of and you'll have to choose very carefully across those priorities but if we and then there are good examples across the world in terms of how you can expand and open that up and encourage behaviors to participate and intensivize that. I think, I think that's something that is and should be scaled and, and perhaps there are some really good examples to follow through there. Hopefully we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be doing something about that in the near future. Thank you, thank you. Um, Gideon as well, did you want to, is this another challenge or have you, got, you, have you solved all of the challenges? <laughs> oh my goodness, no, <laughs> no, no. <I>, <laughs> Um, a couple of a couple of so I was I was looking at what are the challenges to higher education and the word education just popped up and said you know it is about educating the future workforce more importantly the future citizenry uh, of 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 this world and how do you do that um, as as institutions together and uh, th there were two things that I thought like uh, can, can we go back to what are the core values. Uh, as researchers, as teachers, as institutions that we want to kind of uh, work on together and, and we ad uh, adhere to. So I think values, like a value-driven approach, like, and, and those can be three things, right, um, that, uh, th that matter. Uh, and the other is uh, recognition, like how do we recognize people who do that and how do we make sure that the incentive structures are also conducive to that. Um, uh, Paulo Freire once said, uh, if the structure doesn't promote dialogue, the structure must be changed. So I think that there is something uh, there. And in terms of uh, learning, I mean, there, there's so much changes happening. I mean, universities started as really small institutions 
training the elite, and now we're talking about lifelong learning, uh, in uh, training industry. Uh, th there is a lot coming, and a lot of questions are being asked from the universities to do, and uh, that's a very big thing to unpack. So I'm, I'm not going to unpack that. I mean, I don't think we can do that, but we need to start on that journey of unpacking what the university uh, was for in the first place. And I think education is at the heart. Education leads to research, uh, and, and I'll, I'll end with that. Like, I, I always like try to understand like how is a university different from a research institute that doesn't have, you know, it's students. So how do we leverage the fact that we have students in an institution that are learning, that are young, eager, they don't know as much as the professors maybe, but you know, that, that is what makes a university different. So can we jointly bank on that? And, and uh, an example was, in Europe at least, the Erasmus program when it comes to exchange, when it comes to kind of bringing people together, and now you can do that physically and digitally, I think there is something there in terms of open education that, that we might want to capture on. So sorry for the rant. No, that's great. Thank you. It's, uh, uh, I, I'm just going to come to a colleague online, and then I'm going to Julianne, and then I'll come to you. Is that OK? Uh, I, I'm just conscious of, I'm, I'll take that. I'm just conscious of us putting more and more challenges. We need to, <laughs> there are some challenges we need to start thinking about solutions as well. But please, is it Kim? Uh, it's actually Igor oh, has sorry. posted a question in the chat, right. which I'm going to relay to you. I'm afraid it's two more challenges. Um, so competition, as we've heard about this morning, um, he wanted to highlight again as a challenge to global open partnerships. Um, but also the lack of clarity about common goals when initiating collaborations and partnerships. So lack of clarity about goals. We do also have Kim, who is online. Would you like me to hand over to Kim? Uh, yes, and then I, I will go to Julian. Okay. Thank you. Kim, would you like to turn your camera on and we will see you on screen? Thank you. Just checking if you can see me now. Yes, great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of the speakers for their inspirational, provocative uh, speeches uh, and also for all of the very interesting comments in the, in the room there with you and Lise. I specifically want to shout out to Antonio, who I had a great conversation with <laughs> leading up to this summit, as well as to, to see Gideon there, who is a former colleague of mine when we both worked at Leiden University with Simona. So it's great to see you there in the room. Um, I'm still very much puzzling after the plenary uh, part of our summit on the challenge of power and how to uh, uh, give more people power in the knowledge production processes. Um, but you asked also for more solutions rather than challenges. Um, so I want to highlight how at Utrecht University we're working on uh, including more external stakeholders in our education as a way of open education. Uh, and that's through community engaged learning. So we work on um, societal challenges identified together with partners, um, either in the city or our region, but also internationally. And we see how we can bring students, teachers and external stakeholders together to learn more about those challenges. Uh, and I think it will be really interesting to um, see with each other, with this inspiring group of people here, whether we could set up some sort of network on international forms of community engaged learning, where we work from our local uh, communities uh, together on global challenges. I think this network will be great um, to connect all of the different localities there. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Julianne, can I go to you? Yeah. So based on a couple of the comments here, I was thinking about how a network uh, really serves beyond very tangible things. It serves as a space for, for inspiration and, and knowledge exchange. And that's probably the most let's say, important solution, in, in my view, that a network can do. It's not a, uh, let's say, it's not a tangible output, necessarily. Um, but I wanted to, to or I got, was reminded about Kurt Rice's question in the, in the plenary, uh, where he used the word activists and kind of uh, advocacy. And I wonder if when, 
when institutions and organizations are, are signing on to this declaration, it could also be in, um, serve as a way to say we will be the activists or the value keepers or kind of the protectors of knowledge equity jointly. Um, I won't say there's a very ta tangible uh, solution here, but I think that in itself um, is of incredible value. Okay, and how do we make that come to life and spring to life after this? Thank you. Yes, Manuel. Oh, sorry, you need the mic. Sorry, yeah, because... Can I just check, if we're talking to the Zoom people, are they looking at us this way in the camera? Yeah, okay, right. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, very briefly, I, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I, th I think that, that the major challenge here is, is uh, or is kind of a, more like a, like a pitfall that we have to be aware of, is that when we, when we are talking about partnerships, um, there is always an element of uh, we are going out and finding partners to address SDG 3, SDG 5, and sometimes actually we have to sit down and reflect. Uh, the, there is a philosophical, I think it links a little bit with what Gideon was saying. There is a philosophical um, uh, 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 underpinning of what we are doing. And uh, more importantly, I really think that when we sit back and think, we should be looking at what are the immediate, and even not immediate, what are the needs? What are the, the demands, uh, the, 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 the stuff that needs to be addressed? And I think that um, uh, what my colleagues are doing with Pretoria right now actually kind of answers this question. It's a demand-led um, uh, project. There are um, issues we have discussed, whether we have the expertise to address these issues, and then we go and, and we do it. My fear is that sometimes we, we, go, we may go out to create a network or, or to set up partnerships because we have the expertise and, or the other partner has expertise, but first we need to see what is the problem, where is the problem, uh, um, are, are, are the communities we want to engage with interested in engaging with us? Yeah. All these things I need to be, to be um, uh, I think it has to do with the redistribution of ownership of knowledge. Uh, it, it, it comes pretty much around circles, like when we talk about the redistribution of wealth and talk about capitalism, it's kind of the same but with knowledge. Okay, C could I flip that slightly and say who's educating us? You know, this is the room full of educators. I mean, well, but who? who so who is who People is we engage with who, who is understand. educating the educators with the exactly? Do we know the research questions, and and how do we think we know the research questions? Stephen, did you want to? No, jump in. And right now. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the but the I, I was just thinking about what you're saying about stakeholders. It's them educating the. The experts. Here, yeah, exactly, exactly. Sorry, Stephen. And yeah, then well, it's it's related. I the, I mean, I think in academia, we we on the one hand we are the, the the current research culture, but at the same time we're constantly shaping the future research culture in how we educate and train early career researchers or, or students that are coming up through, and so we have lots of opportunity actually to train and, and teach in a way that's based on a, a different vision for what the future research culture is like. Um, I think that PhD is, is a sort of challenge or a bit of a bottleneck in this because as much as we can do sort of collaborative kind of cohort type training and activities at the undergraduate and masters. Often when someone gets to their, their PhD, it's a very individual endeavor. It's not something that, that really sort of promotes or gives a lot of space for collaborative research, for activist research, for even for sort of co-production type approaches. Um, and I wonder if that's kind of a, a key sort of point to target when it comes to our solutions. Like how how do we kind of envision or, or create a different type of PhD and a different type of PhD student and a different a different way of assessing 
a PhD that, that puts more value on collaborative approaches and, and interdisciplinary approaches and activist approaches. Um, nice. And, and maybe that, that sort of trains PhD students in, in open research and open education. And, yeah. You know. Oh, I can feel a new model. I'm coming to you, Louise, straight after. I'm sorry, I can't see your name card. Margaret, Margaret you need the... Uh, thank you, Margaret. And then I'll come to you, Louise. Thanks. Thank you very much, Margaret Korosek, uh, University of Leeds. I just wanted to touch on um, perspective, uh, also what uh, was mentioned earlier about ways of knowing. I think there's something about the knowledge exchange, but there's something about an experience exchange. How do we know those perspectives? How can we even look at the solutions if we're just really hearing ourselves as the audience? We're not really hearing or listening to those other perspectives. It's more about pushing our own perspective through as that solution. So there is something about an experiential you know, exchange or what is the experiential equity in, in this equation? Uh, because I don't think we'll really get to that threshold con concept of, of progressing beyond where we are now until we really have that, that experience. And it touches on the Erasmus experience, being an exchange student when we hosted visitors from University of Pretoria last week. They mentioned professional exchanges. Mm. And I was the first to put my hand up to go to Pretoria. <laughs> so <laughs> it is about, you know, what does it look like to go into another setting and experience that. Yeah, brilliant. And that's part of the Global Academy program of Horizons, but I'm not here to promote that. I'm going to Louise, then I'm going online, then I'll come to you, if that's okay. Oh, sorry, Caroline, I missed you. Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Louise Heary, and I work in global research development. And I kind of think that maybe I'm one of the people who needs to be converted by this event because my role is really to bring in funding for global research, and that is not equitable at all. Uh, or mostly it isn't but the first speaker talked about the democratization of collaborations and he also mentioned that um, in research and innovation we don't need more funding and that may be the case but we do need to change where the funding is going to i think claire talked about fsnet africa and um, that is a program most of the funding goes to African researchers and very little of that funding comes to us here in Leeds. It's also true, it's also true I've worked on lots of projects with um, people who've been collaborating with India or different countries in Africa and they have needed to do a clinical trial and there's no clinical trials infrastructure in those countries which means we end up doing the clinical trial and with that comes we own the data, we mm. publish. And so I think we do need to think about where the funding is going. And one of the things we can do in the Global North, I think, is talk to funding agencies about where we think the funding should, go in, should be going and try to influence in that way, rather than only thinking about influencing, you know, we think this theme, glo uh, climate and health is the next big thing and that's what we want to do we need to have more of an inclusive discussion about that and think about who we're influencing and, and how and, and why. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. I'm going to go online and then I'm going to come to... Oh, no, I'm going to come to Caroline, then you. Sorry. And I'm conscious of the time. Okay. Okay. Um, I've got a, a point from Lucy Talents, which actually refers back to Stephen's point from earlier. And she says, I see empowering students as co-creators to be a solution to some of these challenges. We need the diversity of voices, experiences, and local knowledge to solve global challenges. And it also helps to break down silos if learners contribute more. Thank you. I, I'm just going to take those two questions. And I might ask Jeff, I might ask you to comment on that. Is that OK? Great, thank you. So it was Caroline then. Thank you. Antonio, sorry. Um, so I'm Caroline Ball. I'm an academic librarian at the University of Derby. Um, and mine is kind of a challenge that comes with its own solution. And I think it's a bit, it's a lot more pedestrian, I think, than a lot of the kind of things that have come up today. But for me, I think something that really underpins almost everything that we're talking about is copyright. It's copyright legislation and the need for copyright reform. 
Um, because so much of what we're talking about with open educational resources is effectively bypassing copyright because it doesn't work for us at the moment. Um, because the exceptions that exist, because the fact that the copyright legislation we have was designed for a print era and doesn't work in the, in the digital age. Um, you know, the, the point of copyright legislation was about balancing the, the kind of the interests of the rights holders with the public good. Um, and I think with the shift to digital, which has meant that, that rights holders can control the content so much more through licensing and digital rights management, um, it means that that balance has gone. And it's very much more about the rights of the rights holders than it is about the public good anymore. Um, and so for me, I think copyright reform kind of underpins so much of what goes on here. Because if, if, you know, if we had copyright legislation that worked for a digital age, that recognised the, the digital world that we live in, that recognised that that public good element has been eroded because of the fact that you know, we don't own resources anymore, we licence them, we, we temporarily have access to them, they can disappear at a moment. Um, that has meant, I think, that the drive for open educational resources is, is about access and control and ability to kind of edit and adapt. And all of that has kind of gone, really. Um, with, with the, the, the copyright legislation that we have, which is really not fit for the digital age. So for me, a huge part of what underpins everything in education is the need for copyright reform. Because, as I said, the fact that we are, are putting so much work into open educational resources, which is great for all those resources that we create going forwards, but doesn't address what do we do with the full bulk, bulk of human history, which is not accessible to us in, in so many you know, regards because of copyright legislation. Are you talking okay. about, is that the UK or global? I think globally, because okay. one of the challenges with copyright legislation is, is we all, to a certain extent, take our, our, take our cues from the US. Um, and whenever copyright legislation comes up in the US, the, the kind of various publisher lobbies and, and corporate you know, media and entertainment lobbies absolutely squash it. Okay. Um, and then the, the US and the EU particularly very much influences what goes on around the world due to um, sort of trade treaties and okay. requirements to bring legislation in line. So it's, it's, a, it's a global issue. Mm. But I think one that can actually have a solution within individual countries if they chose to. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Antonio, and then I might, uh, I'm going to ask Jeff. To yes, I'll be brief. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, following uh, um, from what uh, my colleague Kim Sunder Dopp and also what Stephen was making reference to about uh, knowledge activism. Yeah? In my view, my experience, knowledge activism uh, has to start at granular level and when it starts with the students um, is very much to do with uh, service learning because students can also contribute to the community uh, with co-creation of knowledge and that is very much connected to culture and uh, th this has been um, I mean what we are doing here is rather innovative uh, it's very different and radically different, but uh, somehow we are playing with Lego pieces uh, of things that have been already conceptualized. And this is one example, service learning, knowledge activism, and the partnership that uh, Kim mentioned is very important. Uh, having an international partnership for inclusion of uh, society, research participants, participatory research stakeholders in uh, our education. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ask Jeff to comment on the... Um, so, and I, then I'll come to you. Is that OK? Thanks. And then I'll come to you, yeah. So what... I, I know what I want to comment on, but what, what did you want me to comment on? I'm, I'm thinking... <coughs> so we... I will we, just do my own thing. <laughs> well, we kind, of, we kind of went down the sort of PhD and then we started talking about bringing students in at a, a level to co-create and... The, the question online, so I was thinking, and learning and teaching culture as well. So all of that, Jeff, in, yeah. in a minute. It, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I'll do my own thing. Um, no, no, <laughs> okay. no, I, I think I'll pick some of those things up, because I've been, I've been thinking since we started in this session about um, the need to be proactive and not reactive, about the notion of, of open culture that you raised, and about David's notion about open infrastructures. And I think in that in that braiding together of work on open cultures and open infrastructures, that might give us a pathway towards being anticipatory and proactive in this space um, rather than reactive um, and fragmented in this space. N none of those things are easy. And in fact, the infrastructural bit is really interesting, but also not easy because um, open, I've, I have done a little bit of work in my time as a researcher on 
on making technologies and, and open technologies are really hard because they require a community to work on them together for them to have any sustainability. And those don't just magically appear, they have to be curated and created. But there is something, there is something breaking right now, I think, in the fundamental infrastructures that do support education. Um, I think we're seeing them break in the way in which some social technologies like Twitter seem to be breaking around us. So I think things that seemed stable to us are now fragile. And I, so I do think there is an opportunity. Um, and universities have, have the ability to think long term in ways that other organizations don't. I think there really is some opportunity to do some serious work at that intersection of open culture and open infrastructures that might actually make a difference. Um, and then it would all, it, and it's, it's easy in that space, easy, it's imaginable in that space to pull students through in really productive ways, to tap into local and indigenous, indigenous and contextualized knowledges in, in particular ways. Um, anyway, so those are the things I've been Googling and thinking about, because uh, I think th that pairing those together is, it can be potentially very powerful. Brilliant. Thank you. Oh, we could really talk long and hard about this stuff, couldn't we? Thank you. Um, Sala, I'll hand over to you and then hi, Swain. I think we'll probably make that the last comment, if that's okay. So, okay. welcome. Greetings to all. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, Keen Committee for inviting me to participate uh, in this event. Uh, in order to, to reducing uh, the um, inequalities and tackling the challenge, uh, we, we, we have to divide it uh, into um, uh, software problems and hardware problems and infrastructure. Because the participant uh, came from different uh, environments and different uh, levels. Um, uh, equ uh, equity uh, means to, to, to give uh, everyone uh, what uh, we need to be at the, uh, at the same level with other participants. Uh, so I, I just uh, mention, um, uh, I, I, I just want to mention uh, uh, there is uh, some challenges uh, lies between software and hardware and policies. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, that's something we were talking about earlier, wasn't it? And hi, Sui, I'm gonna hand over to you for the last comment because of the time. Not last word. I think <laughs> last one, word. I one important area we haven't touched on is the government's policy and regulations. So the impact on the international partnership yeah. is really, really important because we need to influence the government for that. And you know, there's a lot of things we need to go through in order to develop partnerships, security related and, and other things anyway. So I think that's something if we don't change different governments, different countries having different policies, it's very difficult for us to move forward. Yeah. I mean, this is a really good idea, but you yeah. know, in practice, it's quite, quite difficult as well. So, shall I put on the solution side, change the government? No, <laughs> no you can't change it. It will be the same. Well, <laughs> anyway. I, I do think, you know, policy, government's policy and regulation, that's right. Oh yeah, yeah. Or educate do. politicians. That's it. That's it. They need to. They need to listen to this. That's it. They need to listen to this. Colleagues, we have run out of time. I would like to thank you all for your participation. We're going to have a short break now. I would really encourage you to carry on with those conversations. I'd like to thank the colleagues online as well uh, for uh, your questions and listening, and the two speakers online and Julianne. And enjoy your break. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs>